hi, I'm recording this a little bit later than I recorded the rest of the lecture. Uh, just wanted to make a quick point that I did go kind of very fast through the rest of this lecture. So if need be, remember this is on YouTube, you can pause, uh, you can change the video playback speed. There are a lot of options, and if you still have more questions, you can show up at the live session. So be sure to do that. Hi, I'm Nikhil Jha, and I will be your lecturer for today. Before we get started, just some quick logistics. You can find the associated lab for this lecture on the link that you see on screen. And if you have any questions, feel free to join the OCF chat network. Uh, links are right there on your screen as well. As you might have guessed, today we are going to be talking about the shell, with a focus on the terms that you're seeing on screen right now. But first, what is the shell? So a shell, or a terminal, or a CUI, is just a way for you to use your computer. Uh, what do I mean by that? So when you start Mac OS or Windows and you see the file manager and the desktop, all of that is part of a shell. But what people normally mean when they say shell is what you're seeing on screen right now. A simple text input where you type a command and you see the results of the command below it. Although this kind of shell is very simple, it still allows you to do many of the things that you normally would use your computer for, um, and maybe even to do those things more efficiently. As you'll see in the next lecture, if you're able to do something using the shell, then you might also be able to automate it. So you can be like this guy over here, who has a job that he's completely automated using shell scripts. He goes to work, types something into his shell, and 10 minutes later he's done for the day. And with the shell, this could be you too. So how do we get access to a shell? You're normally looking for something called terminal if you're on Linux or Mac OS. Uh, if you're on Windows, you'll need to use one of the OCF servers. Let's do that now. To do this, we're going to use something called SSH, which lets you access a shell on a different computer. If you do have Windows, the easiest way to follow along is to get this app from the Windows Store, which lets you use the Bash terminal in an emulated version of Ubuntu Linux. We're using Bash for this class. There are other shells out there. Uh, you can use whichever one you prefer, but the assignments will be Bash scripts, so it's best to learn the most common way of using shell scripts. If you're on Mac OS, you can just open the terminal app where the default shell is ZSH. That's mostly compatible with Bash, so you can keep using it if you'd like. But if you'd like to use Bash, which is the exact thing that we're using, you can just run the bash command and you'll be using Bash. So if you don't already have an OCF account, you can get one at ocf.io. Uh, but assuming you do, we can SSH into the OCF server by typing SSH and then your OCF username at ssh.ocf.berkeley.eu and this will work for any computer that has an SSH server running. So for example if we want to SSH into Tsunami, which is actually the same thing as SSH. Oh, we could change that. So when we SSH the first thing we'll see is that we have to check this key. So SSH is encrypted, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, but SSH is just keeping you safe by asking you to confirm this the first time. And every future time that you connect to the server, it'll automatically check this based on what you've seen before. So we say yes, and then it'll ask us for a password. Uh, when you type your password, it won't show up here. So just something to note, you won't see the normal stars that you see in a lot of other password entries. This is a common theme uh, in Linux. Passwords usually do not show up stars. Anyway, so here we are in the terminal. So we can run uh, any shell command. So for example, echo just prints what you have typed. So this will output high. As we can see, it did. Everything you do over SSH is encrypted. So if you want to know what that means, you can take CS161. Uh, but basically it means that anyone snooping in on your internet traffic isn't able to do anything with your session. So let's actually do something with our shell, and we'll start simple. The two commands you see on screen are for copying and moving files. Let's get into it with a demo. So let's learn how to work with files in a terminal. So in a terminal you have a current directory, which is where you will operate on files. 
and you then type a command that operates in that current directory. So to see what the current directory is, it normally shows it here, but we can type pwd to figure out the full path in case your shell does something fancy and shortens it. To see that list of files in the current directory, we can type ls. As we can see, we have no files. To create a file, we can use the touch command, and we'll make a file called demo. So now when we list the files, we have a file called demo. To change the current directory, we can use the cd command. To change to the current directory, we would do cd dot. Uh, as you can imagine, that doesn't do anything. We're still in the same directory. To go up a directory, we can type cd dot dot. And as you can see, we are now up one directory. Uh, and to go back, we can type the name of the directory that we want to go to. And we can copy our demo file, which is still here, to another file called demo2. And we can move our demo file, which in this case is renaming it, from demo to demo1. And as you can see, that works as expected. If you don't know how to use a command, you can use the man command which is short for manual. So for example, man ls will tell us how to use ls. To move up or down, you use j and k, and then to leave this window, you press q. Here are some common ways of referencing a file. Let's get into it with a demo. So our file demo1 here, we can call demo1. So if we cp demo1 to demo2 again, that works. Or we can do dot slash demo1, which means in the current directory, the file called demo1, which is a bit redundant, but it's another way you can write it. We can also say in the previous directory, uh, in a folder called decal, in a file called demo1. This will also do the same thing. And we can also do the full path. So if you remember, the full path for a current directory is all of this. So if we copy all of that to uh, demo1, or sorry, if we copy demo1 with this full file path to demo2, then that will also work. All of these names are equivalent in this case. So all of that was just basics. But one of the really cool things about the shell is that we can chain these commands together. So what do I mean by that? Let's look at an example. cat is a command to output the contents of a file. So here we're running cat on a file called people names. And the contents of that file is being written to something called standard output, which our terminal helpfully shows us on the screen so we can see what's going on. Grep is a command that looks at standard input and searches that for certain text. So if we use cat and then we use a pipe and then we use grep, we can search the contents of an input file. What the pipe does is it redirects standard output of the command on the left to standard input of the command on the right. And you can see how this would be helpful in this example, where we are searching our list of people for people named Anna. We can also redirect to and from a file. So the right angle bracket will redirect the standard output of a command to a file. And the left angle bracket will read a file and paste it into standard input for you. So in this slightly confusing example, we are searching for Anna in the file called people names and writing the list of all the people that we found named Anna to a file called output.txt. So just as another quick demo, we can check what's inside our demo1 file with cat. And then if we want all the lines that include the word cat, we can grab that for the word cat. And it will helpfully even highlight those words for us. And if we want just those lines that contain cat in another file, uh, catted lines, then we can do so, except it doesn't store the highlighting. This highlighting is just something that you see in your terminal and is a special feature. Next, we're gonna talk about editors. So these allow you to edit text from the shell. Three common editors that you'll find are Vim, Emacs, and Nano. Uh, and today we're going to be going over Vim. Why use one of these editors as opposed to Notepad or another GUI alternative? Uh, 
Sometimes you just won't have access to those tools. For example, if you're editing a file over SSH. Also, studies have proven that you are 38% smarter if you use Vim. Disclaimer, that's not actually what this graph says, but... So why Vim? Apart from making you 38% smarter, a version of Vim is available on nearly every computer you're going to use, unless that computer runs Windows. And also, Vim has a bunch of shortcuts that make editing text really, really efficient. So we have this demo one file, but how do we actually edit this file? So we can run Vim on it. So once we're in this file, we can use the H, J, K, and L keys to move around. So L is right, H is left, uh, J is down, and K is up. Um, it seems a little bit confusing at first, but you'll get used to it in no time. You might be wondering if H, J, K, and L are letters, uh, can you just not type those letters? What's going on? And the answer is that Vim actually has two modes. There's normal mode, which we're in right now, and it lets you move around. And there's insert mode, which we can get to by pressing I, uh, which we'll do here. And now I can type whatever I want at the position that my cursor was at. We can also enter what's called visual mode by pressing V. And then we can use HJKNL again to select text. Um, and then we can run something on that selected text. So for example, to copy it, we press a Y for yank. And then to paste it, let's paste it on this blank line, we press P. As you can see, the text that we copied up there has been pasted. There are a lot of shortcuts for Vim. Uh, a few of them are capital G to go to the end of the line, lowercase g, or capital G to go to the end of the file, lowercase g to go to the start of the file, dollar sign to go to the end of the line, and zero to go to the beginning of a line. Um, I could go on for days. So if you want to learn all of them, you should try out VimTutor, which will teach you all of this in excruciating detail. Uh, I missed the most important part. To save what you've written, as you can see, we didn't save, uh, you type colon x when you're in normal mode. And as you can see, we're typing down here uh, when we type a colon. You can also do WQ, uh, which stands for save and quit, but X is a shortcut for that. If you don't want to save, you do Q, and then to confirm, you press an exclamation mark. And the last tool I'd like to show you is called Tmux. Tmux lets you have multiple shells open at the same time, and also lets you keep those shells running even when you're not around, by attaching and detaching from different shells. Okay, so to start Tmux, we'll just run the Tmux command and we'll be dropped into something that looks almost like our normal shell, except we have this bar at the bottom uh, that tells us that we are using session zero and we are on Tsunami. From here, we can do anything we can do in a normal terminal. It is, in fact, a normal terminal, uh, but we have a few extra features. So if we want two terminals, we can press Control B and then a percent sign, and it splits it uh, horizontally. And then to move between these, we can do control A and an arrow, sorry, control B and an arrow key to move between them. And we can run a command here, and then we get bored of this side, and we go over here and run another command. Um, this is useful if you are a super power user and want to do multiple things at the same time. Or maybe we are transcoding a video, uh, which we will do by waiting 20 seconds. And we don't want to use this shell anymore. So we could have split it, and then we can just use this shell over here. Uh, we're still good, and we can watch our video transcode progress. Or we can do something called detaching, which we do with Control B and then press D, and we will have detached. And then we can use our main shell. And to attach again, we can do tmux attach dash T, and we need to remember the number of the terminal, which was zero and we're back to exactly where we left it. You can also do tmux ls to list all of the sessions currently running. And remember, you can always find out about a command using the man command. So if you want to learn more about tmux, man tmux. If you'd like to see how to do more interesting things on the terminal, be sure to show up on Tuesday at 8. Uh, where we'll be going over how to do some other interesting things with the terminal, including compressing videos, for example, when Discord won't let you send files over a certain size, so you need 
to make your files smaller, or whatever other suggestions or questions that people have. So if you want a chance to ask questions live, that's the place to do it. So again, if you have any questions, see the beginning of this video for resources, and good luck and have fun on the lab.